Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we have, for this opportunity to celebrate you. We thank you for what you are doing in our lives. We pray for our nation, Father, that you would draw us closer to one another and most importantly, closer to you. And as you do that, you would make us the people of God you've called us to be. Thank you for all that you desire to do in our lives. Help us to be, let today be a day where we celebrate and glorify the one who gave everything for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea? All right. Why don't we begin with worship?
Well, good morning. Happy Veterans Day. Uh, happy upcoming Thanksgiving. Uh, we're starting to get in that season, uh, and we're certainly glad to see everyone here. We hope you've had a blessed week, and maybe some have had some trying week, but for all of us, that's the reason we're here. We uh, welcome you here, and you should find the connection card in the uh, front of the pew in front of you. Uh, please fill that out if you have either any prayer requests or just connect, just what's going on in your life. Uh, we will have during the offering time uh, a reminder about Operation Christmas Child. Next Sunday is the final Sunday for collection, so if you can bring those in, it would be great. If you go to the Lord this morning, let's spend some time in silent prayer. Just come before the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us as a country. And as we sang this morning, great is your name. Please may we be forgiven for ever taking for granted the freedoms you have given us and how thankful we are for those that have served to protect us. Thank you for the country that we have and for your word that it was built upon. Now for those that have come through an easy week, thank God. We praise you for that. For those that have had a tough week, a tough month, maybe a tough season we've come through as a country, may we bring healing and know that we are all together coming under your name, coming before you this morning. May you bless Pastor Mike, the message that he brings. May you give us ears to hear, and more importantly, Father, a heart to listen. May we take that word and never, never be unbold to go out and present it to a world that's lost and dying. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. Wow, it's November, right? It is. And November is moving on, and we will be celebrating Thanksgiving here very soon. And we all know what happens. At, yeah, and cold, too, yeah. And we all know what happens after Thanksgiving, don't we? Yeah. And, it'll, and it's going to be a short time because Thanksgiving is so late this year on the 28th. And uh, Christmas, of course, always on the 25th. So anyway, that's just my, your calendar update from Pastor Mike today. There we go. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Zephaniah chapter 3. This is our last message in Zephaniah. As the prophet we closes out this text with all the things he's been saying, we'll kind of walk through this text today. And then we'll uh, kind of be getting ready to a couple other messages on some other things. Then we'll be moving into Christmas season. Before you know, we'll be talking about those kind of things, getting ourselves ready to celebrate the birth of our Savior and our Lord. So if you're able, would you stand with, stand with me as we read Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 12 through 20, closing out this text. All right. And the prophet writes, he says, But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and will tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord is your God. The Lord your God is in your midst a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. They re the reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcast. I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Pray today, Father, use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your people today, Father, that our hearts might be quickened and reminded of your great love for us, that each and every day we walk and live, we might be thankful for who you are and what you have done and continue to do in our lives. Thank you for loving us and drawing us to yourself. Bless this time and use it as you desire, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, we look at the text here, and this is kind of one of those texts that uh, is at the close of the prophetic book, and we've seen uh, the prophet say some things that were not all that encouraging for the people of God because of the way that some of them were living, but we see this hope and this idea of a righteous remnant that God is bringing out of his people. And God always kind of has this, this theme is throughout the, the prophets, it's throughout the entire Old Testament, uh, there's the idea of the righteous remnant, the concept and understanding that while many people may choose or say to follow God, there are usually only a handful that stay faithful to him, even through the difficult times. And that's what he's calling these people to remember that, to be faithful, uh, to be among those, those that are declared here. He talks about them in the beginning of this text, in the first 12 and following, when he talks about those I will leave among you, a humble and lowly people, they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. And in times in the world that we live, often there are times when it's, it's hard to find refuge. And many of us like a place of refuge. We like a place of comfort and peace, a sanctuary, if you will, a place where we can kind of rest and focus on things. And yet sometimes life is a little bit crazy. Is that fair? And I think over the last few months, we've had that. And even now, we still have a little bit of crazy going on. That always seems to be uh, the case in our country and in our world. But the reality is, is that in spite of all that, God is still God, God is still in control, and God will accomplish his will and his purposes in spite of what others may think. I think as these individuals were listening to this text, as they were trying to understand what the prophet was saying, as he was speaking to them and encouraging them, they had gone through a difficult time of struggle and trial and difficulty and pain and anguish and questioning God. God, do you still love us? Do you still care? And maybe some of you have felt times like that. Maybe you're going through a time like that at this time in your life where you're wondering, God, where are you? I, I don't understand why I'm having to deal with this. And yet, what we find as we walk through life and we trust our Savior and our Lord is that he walks with us in the midst of those times. Sometimes life doesn't give us a simple answer or the answer that we're looking for. We've kind of been spoiled a little bit into our minds thinking that every problem we have in life can be solved in just a matter of minutes when some problems that we have in our lives take years for us to deal with. We have to wrestle with them. We have to allow God to work in us. Some things that we need to understand in life don't come instantaneously. And yet there are so many times that it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get discouraged when things don't go our way. Does anybody else get upset when things don't go their way? Some of you chuckle. Some of you smile. Some of you don't want to talk about it. And that's okay. I understand. There are going to be times in everyone. If you live long enough on this planet, which is about probably, I would think it would take about a week, if it's that at all, you're going to find that things aren't going to always go your way. You're going to have challenges, whether you work at a job, whether you're going to school, whether whatever you're doing in life. Even when you're retired, there are things, times that things don't go your way, right? How many, how many? I know we have several in our midst that are retired. How many of you, everything works out according to your plans every day? Kind of thought so. That's kind of the way it works. That's the way life is. But that does not give us a reason or a privilege or a right to be discouraged, and to, to be angry, and to just kind of say, well, I give up. But instead, we're called to trust our Savior, even in the midst of times when things are challenging. And that's really a part of what Zephaniah is trying to tell God's people here, is he's reminding them to be faithful, reminding them to trust God no matter what goes on, no matter what the world looks like around you, to be, to be trust, trust him as he describes him in that very first verse. And then he talks about this remnant he describes in verse 13. They tell no lies. There's no deceitful tongue. They are focused on their king and their Savior. They trust him. They know that things do not look and appear the way they want them to. Some of them at this time, he's talking about people that had been in captivity, that had been in suffering, that had been in difficulty. And, and yet, instead of giving up, they chose to trust God. They chose to say, God, I know it doesn't look like you're in control. I know it doesn't look like things are going to go the way I want them, but I know you are faithful. You know, a lot of times in life, I think of the many saints that have gone before us, and I especially have a, I don't know, a desire, and, and a I don't know if it's a desire, concern, but a a love and an admiration for many who have given their lives for our faith in our world. And that is not something that just took place thousands of years ago. That still takes place every day around the globe. People that are facing hardship, people that are facing difficulty, and people because of their faith will lose this life because someone doesn't like the way that they live and the way that they, what they believe. It's a constant reality in the world in which we live. And I wonder as a person is processing through those last moments of life or last days of life what they think about my, my my belief and hope and prayer for us, I'm not saying that we're on the last days, that's what I'm saying, but what I am saying is that we understand that God is in control of all things and we rest and trust our lives and place them in his hands, knowing that he will accomplish whatever he desires 
in our hearts and lives, in and through us, in ways that maybe we didn't see or even imagine. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about one of the apostles that we know quite well. In fact, we've looked at many of his writings. The Apostle Paul, as many of you know, was one who was faithful, and he died a martyr's death. He was beheaded for his faith eventually. Uh, after all those years and all the imprisonment, all the things that he'd endured, finally came the time when they just couldn't handle him and didn't want him around any longer, so they eliminated him. And as he faced his death, he did not seem to be, I don't think he was someone who panicked, who worried. He just knew God was in control and he would trust God's hand even with his life and with his, his death. And all of us, while I don't think are going to face something like that, we face the reality that this life that we live is temporary. Now, I know when you're young, you think you got forever. Because there was a time when I thought that. I am not young anymore, haven't been young for quite a while. I may be younger than some of you in the room, but that's not the issue. I realize that I have, my life has an expiration date. How's that sound? That's pretty morbid. But it's true. All of us have a set time to live on these earth. The Lord knows our days. They are numbered. He knows how, what time we have when he will call us home. And what we have to understand as we walk with him is trust him with the days that we have that God can use us and use this life that we've been given for the most faithful service to him and in a way to exalt and glorify him and to point others towards him. And that's, that's always, I don't say always, but most, that's been my prayer in life, that this life that I live isn't just something I do to pass time, but becomes one that glorifies and honors him. Because none of us know how much time we have. None of us know when that moment that we are breathing is our last moment. And I share that with you not to make you feel dismal, not to make you depressed, not to make you worry, but to make us aware of that reality in life, that that's the way life is for all of us. And yet sometimes we live life and we walk on our faith like, well, I'll get to that later. You know, I know I'd really like to spend more time in God's Word or spend more time in prayer, but you know, there's plenty of time for that. Plenty of time. I can do that later. But that delay in our lives, it's kind of like those conversations. You ever had a conversation you know you need to have someone and you didn't want to have it? Yeah. We all have those kind of situations in life. You want to have it. It's a hard conversation. You don't want to have it, but you know it's necessary and it'll bring healing. It's going to be painful at the time, but it's necessary. And <clears throat> so you have that conversation and you try to put it off and say, well, I can do that eventually. But you never know if you don't do it when eventually won't be a reality anymore. I know many of us have lost loved ones. We've lost, you know, many, I mean, I remember losing one of the, you know, one of the, the toughest things in my life was when I lost my dad here, and it's been nine years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm grateful in that that I was able to have some conversations with him in the, in the latter part of his life that I don't have to worry, say, well, I wish I'd have told him that. I wish I'd have said that. Because I had remembered others telling me how they wish they'd had those conversations. I have a very close friend who lost his father, and he was on the other side of the country when it happened. And they had been close, and then they had drifted apart, and he never got to say anything to him before his dad died. He just got a note from one of his sisters that dad was gone. And he felt cheated in a way that he didn't get that opportunity. And I think sometimes in life we think we've got eternity to deal with those kinds of things. But the reality is... There's a finite amount of time, and it's set in time what we have. And we need to take advantages of those days that God gives us. If you have a conversation you need to have with someone you love or care for, let me encourage you that there's no better time than the present to have it while you can. If there's somebody in your life that you want to let them know how you feel, that you love them and you care for them, why not tell them now? Why tell them at their funeral when they can't hear you? I don't know how many funerals I've done where people were, are upset, and I don't think they're upset as much about the loss as that they never had a chance to talk. And they say wonderful things. Oh, you ever notice nobody says anything bad about someone at a funeral? That's just not what happens. We don't do that. But they say these wonderful things, and I always wonder, did you tell that to that person when they were alive so they could hear them? I mean, it's great that we get to hear them, but did that person get to hear them, the person that you love? And sometimes we, you know... I'm going to pick on guys for a minute. Is that okay? Because I am one, so I figure it's fair. Because we, we have this kind of way that we deal with feelings, don't we, guys? We don't deal with feelings sometimes very well. We don't like to. It's not a part of the way we're wired. That's what we excuse it as. 
But sometimes it's, it's kind of like this. What my wife and I have watched this guy. He does some YouTube videos. really funny. He's called The Relationship Guy. He does some really kind of, it's kind of, he's, he's a Christian. He does some things. But one of the things he says about men that I think is so true, he says that we, you know, how often should we tell our wife that we love her? Daily, regularly, right? But I told her three years ago, it should be good enough, right? You laugh, guys, why? Because it's true. We do that, don't we? It's the way we are. You know, well, I, I, did the, I mowed the grass, or I did this. Or, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. But sometimes we need to tell people that we care about them. And maybe that's part of what God's been dealing with me in my own life, with my wife and I, and just my own, is not having those, is, not, is, is being taken advantage of the opportunities that we have to share those with those that we love, that we love them. To take advantage of the time that we have. Because in this text, you say, well, what does that have to do with this text? It has everything to do with this text. Because this text is about a restoration. It's about the remnant of God's people. It's about God's relationship with his people. Because God has called us not to a religion. God has called us to a relationship with him. And I'm not just using semantics. I'm being as honest as I can be here. Now, religion is a part of the way that we express that relationship. But at its core, it is not, this, it is not the end all. The end all is our relationship with God. Your religion will not save you and help you stand before God in eternity, will it? You can say, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Pentecostal, whatever. I'm non-denominational, whatever that is. And none of that will mean anything to God. What will matter is the relationship that you have with your Creator through His, His Son, our Savior. That is the only thing that will enable us to stand before God and be welcomed into God's kingdom because of what he has done. So it is a relationship that saves us. And the people of God in this day had lost sight of that, many of them, that we've seen throughout the text, that we've looked through this the last several weeks as we've walked through Zephaniah. But here he's trying to tell them that some of, them, some of you got it, some of you understood it. And when he says in verse 14, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Celebrate what God has done. Be excited for the God that you love and worship. Rejoice because he loves you. Now, there are a lot of things in life that I'm thankful for. You know, we, we do that. I don't know if you do that at your gatherings here in a, in a few weeks at Thanksgiving. You try to remember some things you're thankful for, and it's good to do that on a regular basis. It's not just once a year, but it is. But I am most thankful in my life for my relationship with my Savior. Understand, because without that, nothing else would be here. I wouldn't be here, probably. And I'm just saying I wouldn't be in prayer. I wouldn't be around. Secondly to that, and equally important, I believe, is the relationship I have with my wife. I'm beyond grateful for that relationship that we have, that we've been, to, you know, we've been together for a while, and many of you have been together a lot longer, and that's awesome, and I hope many of you get a lot more years than we've already had. We've We've been married for 38, but we've been together since high school. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I'll let you do the math and figure out how long that was. I won't tell you the exact number. If you want to know, I'll tell you later. But anyway, it's been a while. Yeah. Longer than some in this room have been alive by a long shot. But anyway, and I'm, not, I'm talking about adults, not children. So anyway, uh, <laughs> with that in mind, that changes everything about my life is impacted by that relationship. And the relationship with my savior, relationship with my wife, the relationship with my children, that affects how I live, that affects who I am, that affects the way that I live and conduct myself, the way that I treat other people, because it flows out of that, doesn't it? The essence and importance of family and those, those intimate personal relationships is at the very core. So why would not our relationship with God also be exceedingly important? Because everything about our lives ultimately flows out of that, does it not? How you love God, how you walk with God, the relationship, the closest that you have with God, that will affect the way that you live. That will touch your lives. It will touch your family. It will touch your friends. It will be seen at work. It will be seen in the way that you live, will it not? And all too often in a world in which we live, we think of that as something that, well, you know, that's, I got time to work on that. And you do. And I'm not trying to say you don't have time. But why not enjoy the blessings of it now? Why wait till you're 20, 30 years from now to, to try and enjoy that? Why not enjoy it now? I can remember one of the things my dad, as I've told, I've talked about him a lot, and he, one of the things he always told me was he wished he were saved at a younger age. My dad was saved as an adult. He went to church like everybody else did in his little town. 
And he was also not the most, uh, as my grandmother used to say, he was a very ambitious young man. You can take that in a variety of ways. It had very little to do with his desire to get a good job and be a hard working. He was always getting into a little bit of trouble. And so he, he had done that much of his life, but he, as an adult in his mid-20s, at work with his supervisor, began to hear about Jesus. You know, he'd heard it, but really began to experience it. And basically it was his supervisor that led him to Christ and then discipled him. And he was baptized, and I think it was about 20, it was before I was born, but about 26, he was baptized. And it changed everything about the trajectory of his life. It changed our family, and I didn't even know it. I wasn't even around yet, but it's going to change everything because it helped. Because my mom and him, when they would tell me about that, they would say we were kind of at a crossroads whether we were going to follow this God thing or not. They had been through a difficult time trying to have a child and been unable to have a child. And my mother had a miscarriage and those kind of things. I'm, I know I'm talking about myself and my family, but anyway, that really affected them deeply and emotionally. And my mother was very bitter about that, obviously. As many of you women who've experienced that understand how painful that is. And thought that she was never going to have any children. And so they didn't know what to do. But this friend of my dad who had led him to Christ, discipled him, helped him with an idea that maybe, just maybe, he could try adoption. Well, we don't have the money. Well, funny how God works things out, isn't it? And this gentleman helped them start their family. And I always remember my dad. We spent so many times and nights when we still lived in that town over at their house, and I didn't know why we were always over there. And then I found out later that's why we were always over there, because this supervisor, this friend of his, this man who led him to Christ, had started our family in a sense, had helped us, given us the money that we needed, that my parents needed. I wasn't around, so what did I know? I mean, you know, I'm a baby. But all of those things, and I use that as just a thought, an idea of how God works sometimes in the midst of circumstances that you aren't even aware of before you as he works in your life. And we could go around this room this morning and there are stories for each of you how God has miraculously moved in your life, in your family's life, to draw you close to him, to bring people together, to do what he does. And we sometimes forget that that's done in the context of a relationship with a loving father who desires to work in and through us. God did not do that, does not do those things simply because we attend church and we're a member of a church. He does that because of our relationship with him. While I believe church membership is essential and important in our walk and our spiritual pilgrimage and our growth, it is not saving. Do you realize when you go before God, he will not ask for your church membership letter? Did you know that? No. Why would he do that? You will know, he will know that you are his because of what you have done with his son and the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ by surrendering your life to him. And these people were struggling with this idea because they were still thinking about it in the terms of, you know, we got to do these six things. We got to do this. We got to do that. And the prophet is trying to remind them it's, it's not about that. It's about that abiding with him. It's about that trusting him. When he refers to the righteous remnant, those were those people that remained focused on God. When everything else was crazy, they trusted God. And God is and was and is faithful. To walk down a little bit, verse 17 reminds us of God's faithfulness when it says, The Lord your God is in your midst. That should be enough right there. You could probably quit with that part of the verse. Just the fact that God is present is, is, is enough. A victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Do you see a God there that is waiting to destroy you? Is that what you see in that text? Absolutely not. This is the God of the Scriptures. Is he powerful? Oh, yes. He has no competition. He is the one and only sovereign Lord of the universe. He can do as he desires, but he has a heart of love for his children and his people, as he says here. He is their warrior. He exalts over them. I, I, we str I don't know why people struggle to understand that, and especially people that have had kids. Because when you, you feel that way about your kids, don't you? Do you love your kids? Duh. You sure you do. Are your kids perfect? Of course not. Where'd they start? Who'd they come from? We know why they're not perfect, because we're not perfect. That's just reality. But we still love them. And we desire for them, to, we, we want so much more for them 
then they, they can even see it. You know, I know as a, as a kid, I can remember my parents telling me that st- silly line, you'll understand what I'm doing when you have kids of your own, or this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. You've heard that one too. But all of those really show the pat- compassion that a, a parent has for a child, a love that they have for them because they want what's best for them as they nurture them, as they equip them, as they care for them and help them to understand and see the world on their own. How much more does our Heavenly Father have that for us? if we have that for own children. If you love your kids, how much more does your heavenly father love you than you can even love your own kids? His love is deep. His passion is extensive. His, it, it's an abiding presence as described here. It's, it's that idea that he will just, he wants to rejoice over you because he loves you. And he wants to do something incredible in your life, but he's going to to accomplish what he desires, you and I have a part in that. And that part is that we just say, okay, God, we want what you want. We surrender our will to his will. God, we trust you. And that's really all he asks, that we trust him. And that's kind of the, isn't that kind of the commodity of a relationship? Trust? Ladies, is trust important in a relationship? Anybody out there? Well, sure it is. Trust is extremely significant in any relationship. How much more would it be significant in our relationship with our Creator? He's trustworthy, and He's asking us to trust Him. God is always faithful. God always does what He says He will do. Always. Now, I don't always do what I say I'll do. Maybe you don't either. But I'm not God, and that's really good for everybody. So, But God is faithful and merciful. All right. I'm going to walk through. I'm near the end here. As we walk through this, as the prophet reminds them, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to deal at that time. He tells them, he tells them a, a promise. And we all like to have, and he's talked a lot about that in earlier parts of this text where God talked about the judgment on the enemies of his people, that he will judge them. And he, he lays that out again. He reminds them in verse 19 that he's going to do that. But he also says some other things to them that he's going to save the lamb. He's going to gather the outcast. He's going to put to shame I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Those that were the outcasts, those that were set aside, those that they did not bring in with them, those that they did not consider worthy, God is going to elevate them, he says in that text, doesn't he? He's talking about that. Because people matter to God. And not just the perfect people. All people matter to God. I think sometimes we forget that in our walk with him. We forget those who may not be like us, may have some challenges. Maybe their sin is different than our sin, and we choose to not accept them, and yet God calls us to accept and walk with them and draw them in and point them to him. Let me look at verse 20 as we get ready to close this out, because I may get stuck here. There's a lot in verse 20, because this is the closing verse of this, this a prophet, of his, of his prophecy. But the promise of it is what he's talking to. He's talking to his people, and he says, At that time, I will bring you in. Even at that time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. That idea of bringing them in, bringing God's people back, is one that this God's people in that era held on to for centuries, that God would bring them home, that God would bring them in. He would bring them into presence. When you think of God bringing you in, what do you think of? Being home, right? What is home? I mean, we know where our homes are. We know where our houses are. But in a spiritual understanding, in a broader text, as followers of Christ, as, as servants of the Most High God, what is home? Exactly. You know what the best thing about heaven is? It is not the streets of gold. It is not the pearly gates. It is not all the other trappings of heaven that we talk about. It is that God is there. And we are with God. And we are in his presence completely, totally unhindered. There is nothing as it is now, like a veil that separates us in this life to the next. We are with him. We are celebrating him. We are walking with him. We are talking with him. We are engaged with him. We are in his presence in a way that we have never been in his presence before in heaven. 
And that's why it's going to be incredible. I do not have words to describe what it will be. And it's not because of all the other stuff that we think about. Because you think about all those other things we talk about, the walls, the gates, the streets, and all that. That's just like the adornment. That's just stuff. But God is there. Your creator, the one that molded you and made you, is there. The one that designed you. The one that loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you. You will be with him. That is the restoration. That is the hope on a broader sense than what. Obviously, this is talking about the people coming back into their land. That's what the prophet's talking about, coming back home. But in an even broader sense, he's alluding also that there's something bigger that God has planned for us than you even realize. I think God wants to do a little bit of the restoration that he's doing with God's people as he talks about here, not just waiting until we get to heaven. I think he wants to do some of it now. Do you know you can have glimpses of that in this life? God allows us to do that. Have you ever had a time in your life when you've experienced God's presence in a way that it changed you? Anybody awake out there? I know I've been talking for a long time, but you know, I hope you have. If you have not, there's always opportunities. It's not like a lot of times, as, and we do this sometimes, we kind of think, well, everything will be okay when I get to heaven. Well, yeah, it will be. But God doesn't save us just so that we wait to get to heaven, does he? Why does he leave us here after he saves us? What do you think? Huh? Yeah, to serve him, to know him, to experience him, so that others will know. You think that's an important part of it? Yeah. There's a lot of things to it, but the idea of walking with him in this life, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it doesn't make sense, helps us understand who he is and how much he loves us. More and more. You know, in the life that I've been given and the time I've had in ministry, I've had some interesting experiences over the years. And I've walked with people through some difficult roads, difficult illnesses, death, death of a loved one, death of children, all these things that are I wouldn't wish on anybody and would never want to do again, but it just seems like that kind of keeps recurring at times in my life in ministry. And I know I'm not unique in that. Every minister that serves the king does the same things in different settings and walks with people through hard times and good times as well. I, you know, I love those, those celebrations, you know. They're fun. But then there are times that are not so fun. But sometimes the times that surprise me most are the times that I expect to be the deepest and the darkest, and yet they're the times when God is most present. Several years ago, I had the privilege of walking with one of my members and his family as he went home to glory. Now, it was not an easy thing. It was not, I don't know how to describe it. But as he knew he was getting close, while he was dealing with a lot of pain and a lot of pain meds, I'm sure to help cover the pain, as that often do, there was a peace and a confidence that I've never, you don't see anywhere else except in those circumstances. His wife had gone before him many years before and he had missed her. Pictures of her all around his house when I'd go to visit. Lovely woman. Wish I'd got to know her, but she'd been gone for 15 years before I ever met him. And I thought about that time as I was walking even through this text. I think about him often. He was also a minute, had been a minister of the gospel, a bivocational pastor for many years faithful to God and sought to live the way he had been called to live. But as he got closer and closer to the end, you would think, at least from my perspective, maybe for some of us there might be a little bit of fear or even panic. But it was a peace. And the last words that I heard him say, which were a few hours before he passed, well, you know, preacher, I'm going home today. That's what he said. I'm going to see my wife again. I'm going to see my parents. 
but I'm most excited I'm going to see my Savior. I will never forget that time with him. As long as I live, I will remember those moments. I can't escape them. It's kind of part of our relationship that we developed over that time as his pastor. But just getting to know him and his walk. But that he was anticipating that. Showed me a lot about what it means to be a follower of Christ. This life is not everything. It's temporary. And we know that. And I'm sorry if this has been a downer for some of you today that I talked about it, this subject. But it's, you know it's a subject we all have to deal with. Did you know that? We like to think it's something that it'll never happen to us. But it's happened to everybody that's lived on this planet before us. And if the Lord tarries, it will happen and keep happening until he comes back. But our main job as followers of Christ, I think, for that moment is to help ourselves and others be prepared for that, to be ready, to know that he is our Savior and our God. He is in control. He loves us, and it's about going home. And not the home with brick and mortar, but the home made by his hands and in his presence. I will hope in some small way today that I've communicated to you the depth of his love for you. That's my goal in life, and my goal as your pastor, that you and I would begin to understand a little bit more just how much the one who made us loves us. I, I can't adequately articulate it, but I think the prophet says it as well as anything. And I want to read that last verse again as we close. In verse 20, he says, at that time, I will bring you in. Even at that time when you gather together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before, my, before your eyes, says the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for this time, and I pray, Father, today I have been faithful to your text, to your word, to what the prophet had said all those years ago, to communicate to each of us, your people today, who you are, and what you desire for us to hear. And Lord, I pray that, God, you would use this time in the service for your purposes, for your plans to accomplish your desires in our lives. And if there is one here today, either present or on the live stream, that has not come to know you and has experienced a relationship with you, I pray that today would be that day. Because there's no better time than the present to begin our walk with our Savior. Bless this time and use it. May you be exalted and glorified through it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.